I hope our discussions here today will yield innovative approaches and new collaborations across our countries, within our regions, as we also focus on eliminating trade barriers that impede the movement of goods, that impede the movement of services across our borders. And I am very happy that we will be having a conversation in this AU summit on the ACFTA to make it a reality for us to be able to trade, to move goods, to move services across our borders and use the borders we have as bridges for us to move our services across. I am very happy also that more and more countries are eliminating visa requirements for countries within our continent and making it easier for investors, for business people, for entrepreneurs, and for farmers to move across borders and grow food for us as a people. We should do everything to prioritize agriculture and food security. There is urgent need to direct our investments into adaptation, especially in attaining food sovereignty. Last year, as you all know, through the Africa Climate Summit, we made a significant shift in the, in the continent's climate narrative and made commitments on being part of the solution to the climate challenge. In the Nairobi Declaration on Climate, on climate Change and Call to Action that was adopt, adopted at the end of the summit, the continent made commitments to, and I quote, redouble our efforts to boost agricultural yields through sustainable agricultural practices to enhance food security while minimizing negative environmental impacts, end of quote. The African position is aligned with the breakthrough agreements reached in Dubai last year under the UAE consensus outcome and the Emirates framework for global climate resilience, which focuses on giving priority to adaptation to enhance global resilience and reduce global vulnerability by 2030. Through the comprehensive Africa, uh, Africa Agricultural Development Program, each of us committed to a minimum of 10% of our government expenditure towards agriculture. And some progress has been made. The path to Africa's agricultural sector is clear and compelling to harness the full potential of this sector, a dual approach is necessary. On one hand, there is need for overcoming financing and structural obstacles to production and focusing on large-scale agri-projects that are able to attract private sector investors and offer climate-safe economic opportunities. On the other hand, we need a regulatory environment that supports and nurtures the growth of a substantially expanded agricultural sector. We need the necessary laws, we need the necessary regulations, because we cannot continue to depend on subsistence agriculture. We have to scale that up, and we must do it in harmony with the small-scale farmers that are the backbone of our agriculture in our continent. Poor infrastructure in our continent also adds to the challenge and to increasing farm productivity by about between 30 and 40%. And we also lose close to 40% of all our produce because of post-harvest losses. In a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, we import food worth close to $80 billion every year to our continent, a continent with 60% of arable agricultural land that is not cultivated. It speaks volumes of what we need to do, because we know what we should be doing. And we have the potential to become a global agricultural powerhouse and a net exporter of food. In fact, my friends in the Africa Development Bank, and I see Kevin here, they are telling us Africa's food and agriculture market could increase from US dollars 280 billion a year 
last year, we could scale that up to a trillion dollars by 2030 if we get our act together. The report estimates that developing countries will need between US dollars 215 billion and US dollars 387 billion a year for adaptation during this decade. The gap in climate finance is compounded by debt crisis facing many African countries. Consequently, a significant portion of government revenue is allocated to debt servicing rather than climate action. Moreover, the current climate, the current global financial system often results in net outflows from developing to developed nations, exacerbating the challenges of sustainable development and climate resilience. In the past weeks, we've all seen European farmers using their tractors to block roads in protest. In some countries, protesters are calling for more action on climate adaptation, asking for measures to prevent farmland damage by flooding and other forms of extreme weather. In other cases, farmers are calling for fuel subsidies and for fertilizer and pesticide restriction to be reconsidered. While the issues the farmers are protesting against may be varied, it is evident that climate adaptation and protection against impacts of extreme weather events is rapidly ra The failure to limit temperatures at 1.5% at in line with the Paris Agreement is having devastating consequences for societies and also for ecosystems. It, is also, it also means that resources required to cope and respond will continue to rise exponentially into trillions of dollars. For Africa, as the climate impact worsens and becomes more expensive to deal with, priority must be on adaptation to protect our communities from severe weather events given the lowest level of emissions in our continent. The crucial question is how to urgently unlock the capital needed for climate adaptation. Finance for adaptation lags behind considerably that of mitigation, and progress on adaptation financing is slowing as climate impacts rises as confirmed by the 2023 UNEP adaptation gap 